It's interesting how many big high-tech companies were started by two friends, like Hewlett and Packard, or Google's Larry and Sergey. Microsoft was too. Bill Gates co-founded his company, one of the most important and successful in American history, with his high school buddy, Paul Allen. Today, Allen is known more for his mega yachts and palling around with Brad and Angelina than for his revolutionary ideas in the company's early years. But now, Paul Allen has written a memoir called Idea Man out this week, in which he not only gives an account of those ideas, he draws a dark portrait of his fellow co-founder and lifelong friend. As Alan writes and tells us in one of the only in-depth interviews he's ever given, he was too angry and proud to tell Gates point blank, quote, some days working with you is like being in hell. The story will continue in a moment. You describe... Bill Gates, in very harsh terms, um, you describe him as being quite abusive. I mean, it, it's not a pretty picture. And I felt like when I wrote it, I should just tell it like it happened uh, in an unvarnished way, warts and all. You know, here he is doing such great work. He's almost a saint now. Um, and it seems like an odd time to write an unflattering portrait of him. The timing had nothing to do with the many wonderful things that, that, that Bill has done. But the timing was because I wanted to see if I could do it uh, and uh, hopefully be alive to see it published. No wonder he was concerned. When he started the book in 2009, he had stage four lymphoma. The book goes back to the beginning. This is a picture of Alan when he was 15 and met a boy at his private school in Seattle, two years his junior, named Bill Gates. There's the machine room. You can, you can see the machine room in there. I think the UW this video shows the two buddies revisiting an old computer lab where they used to feed their obsession with programming. You lift me into the one of those huge garbage bins. Bill and I would actually dive in the dumpsters to try to find listings of the secret inner code of the operating system You're and kidding. try to figure out how it worked. That's how passionate we were. They both became crack coders, but early on, Alan emerged as a creative dreamer, Gates a cold-eyed pragmatist. You write that when he was 13 years old, he told you, one day we're going to start a company, run a company. He was saying, well, imagine what it's like to run a Fortune 500 company. And I'm thinking, I, I have no idea. You know, my parents were, were librarians. You kept bringing him ideas, and you write in the book, he was always popping my balloon. Yeah, that's right, that's right. I mean, I would have, uh, you know, ten ideas, and, the, and he would kind of pick them apart uh, one by one. One of Alan's ideas Gates didn't shoot down would lead to the personal computer revolution and launch Microsoft. It was 1974. He was a college dropout working in Boston, and one day he spotted a magazine announcing a new small computer called the Altair. He ran to show it to his friend Gates, then at Harvard. I said, here, look at the magazine. You know, this is the computer we've been waiting for. This is how the, the, the PC, the idea that we all have these computers, this is how it started. Yeah, and it's amazing to think back then, uh, nobody had personal computers. I mean, there were computers in universities and research labs and in corporations, but nobody had personal computers. Alan's idea was to write software that would enable the Altair to work as well as those large computers. And so we called up the company that made it and said, well, we can demonstrate this software for you very, very quickly. Are you interested? And they said, sure, if you can really show up and demonstrate it. Did you have software? No. <laughs> you no. Had nothing. We had nothing. So they spent the next eight weeks at Harvard feverishly writing code, but without an Altair to test on. Alan writes that because Gates looked like he was 13, they decided Alan should go alone to pitch their software. Sitting by an old original Altair, he showed me how he fed the computer a paper strip with their code punched into it and typed print 2 plus 2. And then, and then I hit return to send in. And lo and behold, it printed 4. And a wave of relief <laughs> surged over me because I couldn't, I almost couldn't believe it had worked the first time. So that night I call Bill up and I say, Bill, yeah, it's unbelievable, it worked. And we were just... We were just over the moon. 
It was the beginning of the age of a computer in every home on every desk. Almost overnight, people started buying these small computers and their software was in high demand. In 1977, Gates was even interviewed on a TV show. There's a lot of people who are uh, forecasting that there'll be software stores just like there are record stores today and that there'll be thousands and thousands of those. And I think I'd have to agree with that. Allen writes that Gates had a rare gift for programming. He was also the shrewder businessman. From the beginning, he demanded a larger share of the company, 60% and then more. But Allen says he was the one who pushed through the company's big early break, developing an operating system for IBM's first personal computer in 1980. Yet, as the company soared, Allen didn't want to give up his whole life to Microsoft the way Gates did. Well, I've always had so many different interests. But do you think he be came to think that you weren't working as hard as he was and it became a source of resentment with him? Well, I think he was always pushing people to work as hard as they possibly could. Uh, you included? Uh, maybe me more than, uh, than everybody else. You described Bill in this period and actually throughout as, a, as tough, a taskmaster. Um, you talk about his... Uh, yelling, screaming. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of yelling. You guys never understood. You never understood the first thing about this. A 1994 CBS News profile got a sample of Gates's management style, which Alan describes as browbeating and personal verbal attacks. That's ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not doing this thing. No, 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 no. Somebody's confused. Somebody's just not thinking. I mean, there's no way. You had to fight back intensely uh, to stand your ground and make your, your position and your uh, convictions expressed. But he didn't like to back down. So these fights would go on, you said. They, they could go on for hours. Oh, yeah. That's right. We're just screaming at each other for hours? And that, that's exhausting. It's exhausting, but that was Bill's style. Alan was miserable and felt he was being marginalized. And then things got a lot worse. He got cancer. One night he passed by Gates's office and overheard him talking with Steve Ballmer, who'd been hired to help run the company. What were they saying? They were basically talking about how they were planning to dilute my share down to almost nothing. And it was uh, you know, really a shocking and disheartening moment for me. And you were sick? Well, I think I was still probably in the middle of radiation therapy. He burst in and interrupted them. He says they were trying to cut him out and rip him off. And of course, Steve came over to my house later that night to apologize. He did? He did. But Bill didn't come. No, he sent Steve. He sent Steve. It wasn't Steve. He sent Steve. Well, Steve's the one who came. Shortly after, Alan left, but he got to hold on to all his shares. It's hard to feel sorry for him. He was 30 cured of cancer, and own nearly a third of Microsoft. So you built this building. Yeah, this is... Uh, After the company went public, Allen became one of the richest men on earth, at one point worth an estimated $40 billion. Gates would spend another two decades running Microsoft, launching Word, Windows, and Explorer. Thank you. And once he retired, he devoted himself to eradicating global disease and improving education. Allen has spent his wealth on a hodgepodge of many interests. For instance, he plays electric guitar, so he has his own personal rock and roll band to jam with. And he bought Jimi Hendrix's Woodstock guitar for $750,000. He likes science fiction. He subsidizes an antenna farm listening for aliens. An avid reader, he showed us a Shakespeare folio he keeps at his estate. You became the owner of right. the Seahawks. He likes football. He bought an NFL team. He likes basketball even more. He also bought an NBA team. He's a movie buff, so he invested in DreamWorks, the Hollywood studio. He wants to travel, so he built himself a yacht longer than a football field, equipped with its own submarine. He has spent over a billion dollars on philanthropy, including building an institute to study the brain. And like Gates, he's pledged to give most of his money away to charity. Now, he got married. Right. You never got married. 
Not yet. Not yet. I'm still optimistic. I, I still believe I'm going to meet somebody, uh, and that's going to happen. But uh, um, you but want I, to. I want to have a family. But he's often described as a recluse. Each of them has about something struck me when he showed us his collection of vintage warplanes. I get this Howard Hughesy feel. With the planes, uh, Hollywood. Do you do you think about that ever? Well, I hope I don't end up uh, in, in, a, in a cinema by myself watching I Station Zebra uh, <laughs> over and over again. I think uh, I've got s such a diverse set of interests, movies, aviation, technology, um, Howard sports Hughes. teams. Well, I don't know if Howard was involved in sports teams, but... Alan's diverse set of interests also led him to invest in over a hundred business ventures. Most of them were poorly managed or ahead of their time, so they flopped and he slid from being the third richest man in the world to 57th. Were you just too early? Or was it that you really needed a Bill Gates and didn't have that other person to push it through? Uh, it, it, look, at the Microsoft days, you had some great ideas and some great execution between me and Bill and many other people. You know, in technology, most things fail. Most companies fail, um, but I had some whoppers. Some of his whoppers, however, produce numerous patents. Last year, in a move that angered Silicon Valley, Allen sued several giant companies, accusing them of infringing on those old patents. Who are you suing? Oh, it's a long, it's a long list. AOL, Apple, eBay, Facebook, Google, Netflix, Office Depot, Office Max, <laughs> Staples, Yahoo, and YouTube. Right. H how do you argue that you had something to do with Google. It just seems so outlandish or, or kind of wacky. Look, Microsoft and Google, all these people have patents of their own. They all enforce patents. They all charge other companies for patents. And all I'm trying to do is, is uh, get back the investment that I made to create these patents. We kept hearing that what he's really trying to do is gain That's recognition a as a tech and, uh, visionary. But with his book, Idea Man, he's being branded a bitter billionaire. What's your reaction to, to people saying it's, it's kind of a, a revenge book, a bitter book? Uh, it's not about that. Uh, I just felt like uh, you know, it's an important piece of technology history, and I should tell it like it, tell it, like it happened, and I hope people uh, understand and respect that. But for all the bad feelings Alan writes about with Gates, near the end of the book he reveals something that happened when he got cancer a second time in 2009. And right. he came to see you, he comforted you when you were sick. Right. Uh, Bill came, you know, here to my, to my house multiple times and we had some great talks and uh, there's a bond there that, that can't be denied and I think, uh, I think uh, we both feel that. Even after the book? I know he's read the book. Right. No, I'm sure, I'm sure at some point we'll, we'll sit down and talk about the book, which we haven't done yet. To the You'll book have a and, screaming match? Well, I, I don't know about screaming, but it'll be, I'm sure it'll be a heated discussion. Do you think there's any reason that you're going to have to apologize to him now? I don't think so. We asked Bill Gates for a comment, and while he declined, he has said that the founding of Microsoft was an equal partnership, and Paul deserves more credit than he's often given. Go to 60minutesovertime.com to see what billions have bought for Paul Allen, sponsored by Lipitor.